trying to make that landscape budget go, you cut back on the shrubs, definitely the flowers, because they just fill in and they're easier, they grow faster, they cover a lot of, you know, if you've got a dog leg on a red tip photinia, within a year it just fills out, you can't tell. But on a tree, if it's got a crook or a bend or a, it's there forever. Trees are kind of like people. Some people are just beautiful and you can't take your eyes off of them. And as they mature, they just get more beautiful. Trees are like that. And some are just the ugly duckling. And with age, it just doesn't, doesn't help. They almost accentuate. They get bigger and go, look how crooked my, my trunk is. Look how empty and bald this side is. It doesn't fill in. So you really do want to pick, hand pick. If you've got landscapers that are doing the work for you, you want to come in and hand pick those yourself or come with them. You don't want them to just come in and go, yeah, I'll take three of those. You pick, load them up because they're after speed. They're not after quality, that kind of stuff. So this is where you really want to do your homework. Today we're going to show you kind of the most popular uh, plants, not by any means all of them. Uh, I put, I'm going to have two handouts for you today. One is a top 10 plant list. Uh, and we break out the trees, top 10 flowering trees, top 10 evergreen trees, top 10 fruit trees. It just go, breaks it all down. There's more than just trees or shrubs on there. It's two pages and it's just a list of 10. By no means is it everything, it's just the 10, 10 most popular that people plant here locally. And then I've got the actual planting, how to plant. And we'll go into detail on that because planting is everything uh, with trees. If you just take a tree, this is for you folks in the Midwest and the South where you just, I could chuck this hat on the ground and start to grow. We don't live in that area anymore. This, you've got to take some energy and some time to put that thing in the ground correctly, and all of a sudden it takes and starts taking off. You can't just chuck open the ground, tuck it in, and, and, and watch it grow. It doesn't quite work that way, especially if you're in that real heavy clay kind of soil. Okay? So why don't we start with the tree piece, showing off the trees, to get a feel for what they are. I'll start with shade trees. And we, we're actually pretty famous for our blooming trees. We've got a lot of blooming, mainly in the spring, although I've got some summer bloomers as well. So right now, the desert willows, this guy right here, this is in bloom, it's a native. It's in bloom in Dewey, Skull Valley, all, kind of all the ridge lines around here. This thing is in bloom. You'll see a tree kind of growing up about 15 feet tall. Mostly when it's wild, it's going to be multi-stemmed, up to about 15, kind of vase-shaped. Uh, and it has this beautiful flower, a pink flower. Uh, hummingbirds think they've died and gone to heaven. This is one of their main food sources. So they're just trained to go to desert willow. This one happens to be timeless beauty, uh, which is we've got, we've come up with a we've grafted or have a, a preferred variety where it's less likely to put a bean pot on. And so with the native one, you'll see beans start to form about now. If you're to pick those beans off, it instantly go back into bloom, just like that. So you can force it to bloom several times a year. Uh, this one, we've just bred it where it doesn't form beans. So it automatically just starts blooming by itself. Less work, more beauty. It's also got a little bit richer color to it. But this, this is a local native kind of tree. It's part of that Southwest. You want to go back to zero scape, that kind of stuff. That's the one. A companion plant to this would be this one. This, this is a chaste tree. C-H-A-S-T, chaste tree. This one grows the same size as this. About 10, 12 feet tall, vase-shaped, multi-stemmed, and it has these blue flowers all over it. Butterflies, monarchs, swallowtails, painted ladies, they all love uh, this particular plant. It's a pollinator. It's been in bloom for well over a month, and it will continue to bloom for another month. You can just count on it. Every summer, this thing is going to have bloom. Blooms all over the top of this plant. Equal water, equal sun. It's just a companion plant, and it sort of has that southwesterny kind of look to it. They call it chase tree, in case you want like uh, plant history. Back in the Dark Ages or Middle Ages, uh, if you talk to your priest, you guys will understand this. You're in your youth, kind of feeling your oats a little bit. They'd go, uh, either take a cold shower or take some of this chaste tea and it will calm you down so you're not so, uh, how do I say that? Classy on film. We I'll get the like, idea. I'll let, yeah, I'll <laughs> let you all, uh, you know what's going on. This one is, 
this is smoke bush. Comes in green, purple, and this kind of chartreuse look. Again, it grows up to about 10, 12, 15 feet tall. Very drought hardy. And they call it smoke bush because the flowers, as it blooms, has this smoky look to it. It almost, when you see the sunset going, it looks like it's on fire, smoky. So this is smoke bush. All of these are companion plants in the landscape. All of them are very tough, and they're also all deciduous. That is, they'll lose their leaves in the winter. Okay? So smoke bush. You'll see this all over town. And then lastly, I brought this bad boy here. He's already poked me once. He wants to do it again. This is, this is related. We actually grow some beautiful yucca trees. We don't grow palm trees here. But we do grow yuccas better than anyone else in the country. This is related to Joshua tree. You'll see some in front of the VA. They're kind of sporadic. You'll see them around. Tall tree up to maybe, I don't know, 8, 10 feet tall. Um, this one is, of course, linked to Texas. They take a Joshua tree and put it on steroids. This is a Texas Joshua tree, basically. West Texas yucca. Again, it forms a big trunk. Just has a bigger leaf to it. Evergreen. Super drought hardy, same zone, it goes down to zero degrees, uh, and it just does this all the time. This is an architecture kind of plant. It's a southwestern mix, and it goes with these guys. This is your southwest mix of trees that you want to plant out in the yard. I think what you need really, when you start out, you need shade. Especially folks in the newer lots where they just bulldoze this thing over, and you're surrounded basically by cinder block, and it's just hot. You need to create some shade, and a pergola is great, a pad, covered patio is okay, but trees actually cool their surroundings. They not only provide shade, they actually, they're like an evap cooler for the backyard. And so let me go over the shade trees, the most popular ones. I brought three. I tried to come in threes or fours. There's way more than that, but at least you get a feel for it. Um, this one is the number one seller as far as Midwest kind of stuff. Get it over here. This is, can the folks on the line see that? Hey, let me show oh, you. Yeah, there, there you go. go. That's oh, a, yeah. maple, a maple tree. <laughs> um, this is a uh, blaze maple, Acer Fremontii. Uh, this is a preferred variety for here. This is the fastest growing of the red maples. This is one where you want to do your homework. Be careful what you buy. Uh, the Acer Rebrum, like the one you find growing up in the East Coast, Midwest, the traditional maple. That one does grow here as well, uh, but it, the wind, when it's young, it tends to tear the leaves. It gets leaf tatter quite a bit, so it looks pretty rough when it's younger. As it matures, it fills in and starts to protect itself, but this one, with this deep lobe to it, there's something about this where it just lets the wind go through it and it doesn't tear. So if you're up on the ridge lines, if you're up on the windier areas down that valley where it just whips through, uh, the wind will just get it where it just tears these leaves. This one doesn't do that. This will put on about three feet a year. It's pretty impressive, actually. Uh, it is a true tree. We're talking 35 by 30, uh, maybe even 40. I've got one that's maybe close to 40 foot. It's got a trunk on it like this, and it shades the entire front yard. It's a great shade tree. And then in the fall, it does turn blaze red. That's the name, blazing Fresca maple. That's, that's the name, okay? If you like a maple, one to watch for, just a, this is for my SoCal folks. Japanese maples do not grow very well here. I know you had it in full sun out there and everyone wants one. And you can grow it here too, but don't believe the tag. The tag says grows in full sun, loves, everything about Prescott, Arizona. No, it doesn't. Uh, Japanese maples, which is that smaller maple, the smaller leaves, um, that one does not like alkaline water, doesn't like wind, doesn't like sun, doesn't like pretty much anything that Prescott offers it. Now, I grow some myself. I love Japanese maples. I grow them in containers under my patio on the north side where I can protect it some. I can isolate it from uh, the, the wind coming through or I can go give it a part bay sun instead of full sun. It will grow out in full sun, like it says, but it will be the ugliest tree you've ever seen. It'll have burned tips. Leaves will just be shriveling. You won't be able to water it enough. It's just not ideal. You gotta put it underneath the pine trees, 
where it's, where it's filtered light, that's where it does shine. It's not about the cold. It'll take the cold that we give it. It's about the June sun and wind and dryness. That's what really does the, makes it look ugly. So kind of watch, do, do your homework or ask. This one does great on the full side, no problem. Of course, you can't be in the mountains of Arizona without this bad boy. This one is aspen. So quaking aspen, or as the leaves kind of shimmer through it, the leaves kind of, uh, populus tremuloides is the Latin name, trembling leaf poplar. Uh, this one does grow quite well here. In fact, Aspen Creek, it's just you could walk there. It's right here, it's just, they just grow in the, in the hilltops everywhere. They'll grow at lower elevations, like Prescott, Chino Valley, Prescott Valley, do it. It'll grow in all of those, as long as you put it on drip system. If you're gonna water it, it'll grow just fine. In fact, if you kill this one, it will be from overwatering, quite, quite honestly. Uh, we find that folks tend to, they think, oh, it's a poplar, it needs a lot of water. I would say once or twice a week is plenty for this guy. Give it a deep soak once a week and it's probably just fine, it will grow. Again, this one's a very fast grower. Uh, as it matures, the bark becomes white, whiter and whiter. As, as the bark thickens, it gets whiter and whiter, like paper white. Uh, that's, that's this guy. Um, one thing to watch, this one, we actually grow, I, gotta, I can't take this, I gotta have my DNA. It's within my DNA, I just can't take, it's a different ugly, it's bothering me. Um, what you'll find, there's two, there's three kinds of aspens you'll see sold here, uh, as, you, as you look at garden centers. One is a European aspen. What is that? It's, it's my magnetic personality. There you go. <laughs> um, uh, Swiss aspens or European aspens, they have the same kind of leaf to it, but it's very serrated. It's and it doesn't tremble. It's just a it's a European cousin of this. Um, so if you're going to plant an aspen, go local. This is the better one. It'll adapt better. It lives just as long, and it, it actually shows off. And this in your mind, this is what you're wanting. Uh, this is the one, aspen gold the fall. Beautiful. This is a good companion with the mat with the maples. You get that red and the gold look. Um, I use these quite often as frames. If I see a beautiful vista, I'm helping you design, I'll go, oh, we want an aspen here and here, and we'll just like a picture frame. We'll force everyone that sits on this deck to look this way, down to the dells or out of the peak or through a beautiful tree, or we'll just look, we just look away from that huge home right next to you and look over here. And we'll just use it as a frame. We'll put some pretty stuff down there. So can, these are great ones to design because they grow to the moon, but not quite as wide. So they'll go 50 feet tall, but maybe five feet wide. So, and they are always very social. You never get just one. They like to grow their families. They like to have suckers coming up. If it's suckering or it comes up someplace where you like it, let her grow. If it's someplace where you don't want it, it's like, take a shovel of the head, like a serpent, just pop it out of the ground, don't, don't let it grow there. Just don't let it get, get started. You'll see some aspens, so you got European, then you'll got, you've got wild dug aspens also. Uh, some ranchers will go out, and they'll just have the cowboys go dig some aspens up in their grove on their property. They'll just take these ball of burlap, they'll, have, they'll be wrapped in burlap uh, uh, fabric, and they'll put them in a bucket, and you can always tell them because they've got the character to the bark. They're, they're marked out. They look like they're native, like they've lived a hard life. Um, I've stopped selling those just because they don't take as well. You'll lose typically one or two of the branches. So you come in and buy it, and you know six months later, this branch dies. That's not what people came to buy, buy an aspen tree from Waters Gardens. That's not why they came here. So here what we did is, we actually took three bare root aspens and we have cookie cutter. We have actually planted three trees and we've created our own cluster that looks natural, but it's so perfect. It is. That's, that seems to be, and they all take. They're much more consistent as far as transplant goes. Those are the three types, Swiss, Native Doug, and Waters Garden Center. There you go. Aspens. And then I got this one, which is on the courthouse. This is pretty much a, this guy's too wide, bother me. 
Okay. Elm trees. This is a two-part lesson. This is uh, um, this is the elm that grows on the courthouse. So actually, we've been introduced to this from quite a few of them. We have American elms on the courthouse downtown. It's a big leaf elm. Uh, what we've done is we've grafted, we've, we've hybridized, or come up with a new, by grafting, we've come up with a new model. This is called Frontier Elm. It doesn't get the seed. We get all these wild elms, or Chinese, or Siberian elms. Uh, you can go buy those from a competitor's garden center. Uh, I would never sell them here, because it's basically a weed. It's disease-ridden, bug-ridden. It's just you don't want one of those in your yard. They throw seed everywhere. They're just weedy. This guy doesn't do that. It doesn't get the, uh, there's, a little elm, there's a little beetle that skeletonizes the, the leaf, called elm leaf skeletonizer. Gets on all the other varieties, doesn't get on this one. So you don't have to spray, it doesn't get insects. This one turns a beautiful, uh, kind of orangey red color. Most, most elms turn gold. This one's red, very, very unusual. The perfect shape, it's got a perfectly groomed shape to it. This is called Frontier Elm, uh, and it is tough. I mean, it grows and roots and gets a substantial trunk, substantial, it's a shade tree. We're talking 40 by 40, 40 by 35. It's a big shade tree. It looks innocent here, but it grows big and it grows fast. Just stay away from the native, the wild one. It's actually not native, it's invasive elm tree that grows wild here. Um, you don't want that one in your yard. Yeah, you get rid of them. Well, that's why, that's why I love a brand new chainsaw sometimes. You just cut it right down to the ground and you, you start cursing at it. Hopefully it dies. So that's elm tree. That's, yeah, hedgerows are, are bad, so they keep, they'll keep growing. That's where the seed will come in and just pop it up every year. Now let's go with uh, flowering trees. So blooming. So we're kind of famous. They get kind of announced. Spring is here. Uh, they'll start in March and they keep blooming really through May. So March, April, May, there's a whole series from crab apples to service berries to this particular guy is called Chanticleer uh, Ornamental Pear. It's related to fruiting pears. This one does not put a fruit on it though, but it has the same flower. Pears have a real pretty bright old white flower to it. Uh, so this will be covered before it leaves out. It's just covered in white flowers. It's going, I'm happy, it's spring. This one grows quite nice and almost as a shade tree. It'll go up to 30 feet tall, about 15 feet wide. It could be a small shade tree compared to, I mean, trees can get 50s, 60s, 80 feet tall. This is half that size. It's about 30 by 20, something like that. Um, I like this one because it's a thick shade. It's got a waxy uh, leaf to it, so, which makes it very tough. This wax coating to it makes it very drought hardy. And then this is the actual, the very last tree to turn red in the fall of the year. So your ornamental pears, are the, when, it's, when it turns color, it's winter now, that's it. And that'll be about the first of December. This is when this one will go about Thanksgiving through the first couple weeks in December. That's when this one is showing its fall color. By then, the aspens, they, they shed their leaves a month beforehand. This guy is still looking green. When the aspens are, are gold, these guys are still green. So it's just one of the last. It just gives you this interest as you're designing, gives you this color wave going through the landscape. I like it because it's got spring color, summer shade, fall color, and then it's got, as it ages, it gets this real light gray, not quite as white as an aspens, but it's got very interesting bark to it. So it looks good even in the winter. So very, very tough plant for your pretty bloomer. The one that blooms before that, this guy's been my nemesis the whole, whole class, just so wide. Um, anyone know what this is? It's got a heart-shaped leaf. Red bud, yeah, really good, very good. Red buds, red buds do really well. There is a native red bud that grows wild here. It's called a western red bud. It's short, gets up maybe 10, 12 feet tall, has a smaller leaf about half the size, uh, but it just grows wild. You see this pink blooming big shrub or short tree out there uh, with a heart-shaped leaf? That is our native uh, red bud. Well, most folks don't want a little shrub, they want a bigger tree, and so we've got 
a whole series of red buds that grow here, uh, and they're all equally as hardy. They're very tough. Uh, eastern red buds, the one that you, you knew, you know it's got a lighter pink to it. We also have introduced several varieties that have the same kind of leaf, but has a brighter pink flower. Oklahoma, Avondale, there's a whole series of, of, and now we're introducing varieties that have a purple leaf to it. So with pink flower, purple leaves, we're trying to introduce more varieties that add some interest because they're just so tough. This plant does not get that big. Again, about 15 feet tall, but this one doesn't grow vase it grows a perfect round head to it up to about 10, maybe 12 feet tall. So thick foliage. Uh, it'd be good on a patio or something. Really, it's good as an accent tree in the middle of the yard. Uh, a great little plant. In the spring, we cannot keep, when they go into bloom, uh, we have to load up with them because we know when they go into bloom, everyone's going to come in going, I want that pink tree. It's this red bud. I'm going to bring this one around. And then, the one that companion plants with that, I'm sure you've seen these around town, in your neighborhood. This can almost be overdone sometimes. This is purple leaf plum. Or it's a prunus family. So again, there's a wild variety of, of cherry uh, variety of this. It grows wild in the forest. This one gets a pink flower in the spring of the year, uh, but then it puts on this purple foliage right afterwards, and it stays this color. This is the color in spring, this is the color in summer, it's a color in fall, it stays this color. And so, very draw hardy, kind of vase shaped, uh, thick branching to it. Uh, and animals don't eat it, Bug doesn't get bugs. Every once in a while, this year, they actually form little pears, or little plums, which is very unusual. About every three to five years, you'll see them load up, they look like cherries but they taste like a plum. So, but generally, this is an ornamental, it's just for show, the flower is just for show, and it generally doesn't fruit. Okay, so, several questions there. Big trees do have big roots. Will they affect, are they affected by clay soil? Um, that's, did I get the question pretty much right? Get it for you folks online or back there. Um, yes, big trees do have big roots. Generally, what happens with the roots, and I'll go into this in detail when we go into planting right for the evergreens. Um, generally, the roots don't get out very far. They go out. Even big native, you'll see a bulldoze, a great big juniper that's like 400 years old. It's only got roots maybe three feet in the ground, but they're out like this. They just go out like this. And that's how your plants will grow. They're gonna be just underneath the surface and they're gonna grow sideways. So that's, that's what you're gonna get, no matter what kind of tree. The bigger the tree, the bigger the roots though. This one is a native, in fact, a lot of the junipers you see, they aren't junipers, they're this. This is Arizona cypress. Uh, it's a big tree, 25 by 12 foot wide. We use this for windbreaks, screens, especially out in the valley areas where we need to, we need to cut that wind down coming from that southwest. Uh, we'll put a row of these in and, and uh, it cuts that wind down. Uh, animals don't eat it. So deer, javelina, elk. Uh, interesting side story, just because, well, it's my time. You're just here, leave when you want. Uh, I had a big bull elk. So we had a row of these going down the driveway in Skull Valley. Skull Valley's got a pretty substantial herd of elk. They come down in the, into the ranch land and they they eat the rancher's stuff and drink drink from Kirkland Creek. Anyway, I had a 25 footer of these and this big bull is like in rut. I mean, he is like, look at my stuff, ladies. I am so big and powerful. And he's going down the driveway, he's dangerous. I mean, you gotta get out of his way, he's gonna kill something. He looks at this 25 foot Arizona Cypress, huge rack, and he just ripped it a new one. By the time he got done, he had shredded. There was no leaves left, just a trunk and some branches on the bottom. And I don't know if the ladies were impressed or not, but he kept strutting his stuff past the barn and kept, jumped the fence and kept on going. Uh, but he didn't eat it. <laughs> he just shredded it. So anyway, I don't know where that story came from. Just the things you see over your decades of gardening. Just watch this. It was awe-inspiring. Um, 
And this one grows, uh, doesn't really get pollen. It doesn't get a berry on it. What it does, it gets a little tiny pine cone about that big. And that's how I identify what's the difference. If it's a berry, it's going to be a juniper. If it's a, a cone, it's going to be an Arizona cypress. Okay. Same foliage, you got that classic Arizona blue, um, which looks good. Okay. This is spruce. Spruce trees grow really, really well. Folks new to the area, let's say they've been more of a desert variety of tropical uh, climate. They go, I don't know what the name is, but it looks like a Christmas tree. But that's a spruce tree. Uh, central trunk, branches that swoop out from there. All the new growth is, is uh, kind of you know, factoids. I should put together a book sometime on just plant trivia. I don't know, it's just interesting to me. Um, spruce, this blue color, that actually rubs off. You can actually wipe that right off. It's a secretion the plant puts on to keep bugs and animals away. Um, so the new growth on spruce, generally, the old growth is green, the new growth is blue. There you go. So you, who knew? And then another tri trivia thing, this is this year's growth. So you can see what grew on this one this year because the color. You can just tell these, that branch is this year's growth. So how much will this grow a year? Oh, about a foot. That's about right. So most spruce are gonna be uh, 12 to 18 inches or so. That's about what it's gonna grow. But it's consistent, it fools you because it grows, it puts a foot here, a foot here, a foot here, a foot here, and puts a foot everywhere. So it grows fast, it just grows all over, and that's where you get this beautiful shape to it. Um, that's spruce, there you go. Colorado spruce is the biggest, most famous one. What we're doing, this is a hoop size spruce. A lot of folks want that more silver blue to it. And so what we'll do is we'll take a graft, we'll actually cut a branch, one of these branches off. We'll graft it on a rootstock. We'll get this preferred, beautiful kind of mother plant. We'll take a cutting off of that. And we got an exact clone of that plant. And so we'll grow it out from a, from a, a graft as so you get a preferred color to it. That's what hoop size is. If it's got a name to it, Probably it's been grafted to be a little bit more expensive, but you'll get this richer, deeper, or better shape to it, or it's dwarfed. So Fat Albert spruce has a great color, and its, it's, it's cousin is a Colorado spruce, but it only gets up to about 15, 18 feet tall, whereas Colorado spruce goes to the moon. I mean, 50 feet, it keeps going. It never stops. Uh, it's kind of too big for a lot of yards. This is Arizona blue. And some of you, you've got a bunch of oaks. You've got a lot of this color. Sometimes you can get too much of this color in the yard. And so you kind of want to introduce some of this color. So this is the one I used in my yard. This is a Spartan Juniper. Uh, grows up to about 10, 12 feet tall by about six feet wide. Um, I've got this beautiful view of the Dells. It's, it's a premium lot. You have two stories, you dig out the side of the hill. Uh, to get the two-story house, get the basement in. But the negative with that, that kind of neighborhood is, your neighbor's right across the street from you. They're, they're above you, looking down into your front yard. So we get this beautiful patio, and we love sipping coffee, watching hummingbirds, listening to the fountains go. And I don't want, my, I don't want you coming down, looking at me while I'm in my jammies sipping coffee. And so I go out and I just use these to line the street. I zigzag them. So now I feel like it's a secret garden. Yeah, you can see me while you go down the driveway, but still, it feels much, much better. So I used the green. I wanted the green because we're in this chaparral area where it's lots of blues already. You know, pinion pines kind of have that bluer look to it. Arizona cypress has a bluer look. A lot of the juniors is bluer. This is a good contrast plant uh, with that. But still, junipers, they're tough. This is juniper country. The next question I get is, well, I'm, afraid, I'm allergic to junipers. If you're allergic to junipers, if you're allergic to junipers, you're in the wrong town because you are surrounded. And when those things pop, have you ever seen a juniper? It's only the males do this. The females have no pollen. Males have pollen. They're pollinating the whole forest, and one male wants to do like the whole mountainside. Literally, it will it will blow up. Literally, it will explode with pollen. And this huge cloud goes up and floats across the hillsides. This one does not do that. 
we've bred out the pollen. So again, you know, males, females, it's just, and it's so small, it doesn't, if it, even if it did have so little pollen, it wouldn't make any difference. So, but the great thing about junipers, they take our sun, they take our wind, they take our alkaline water, um, they take our, our winters, they're just tough. And so you just see that proved out in the forest. We just have huge juniper forests. Ah, Spartan junipers. There's so many other varieties. I just brought, I brought, this is the number one seller and I brought my favorite. Okay, from there you can, there's a whole wall of them. Uh, Italian cypress grows here. That's the one that grows to the moon, like 50 feet tall by three feet wide, round. So it's just right up as a cylinder. Yes? How big do those grow? These are about 10 by six, something like that. So, and dense. So they look innocent here. Most of your evergreens, they need to be in the ground for a season uh, and root out before they really fill out. We get them as full as we can, but in a bucket, they just don't fill out as nicely. In the ground, once those roots go out, they just start, the, like the second year they're in the ground, they just go whoop, and they fill out just like that. Lastly, I'll give you this one, and we'll go over how to plant. This is a pine tree. I brought this one just because it's unusual. The Austrian pine, Kenyan pines, I've got all those. But you know what those are. This is a Vanderwolf pine. It's related to white pine. Uh, I like this one because it's soft. So many evergreens are, are uh, like you get a rash, they just poke you. Uh, they're, they're like very aggressive. This one's very, very soft. And it's got this two-tone needle. So it's green on one side, blue on the other. So it gives it this frosted, just an unusual, pretty look. This is super drought hardy. If you kill it, it'll be from overwatering. All, all these evergreens, if you're gonna if you're gonna have problems, it'll be from overwatering. In fact, we'll go over that next. How to plant? I'll cover that. Um, this one grows up to about 10, 15 feet tall, about this wide. It goes much taller than it does wide. It has this beautiful, soft green. It looks real pretty by the front door with Christmas lights on. It just looks. It's just a pretty tree. Good thing about most evergreens, animals don't eat those. So if you're in that wildland interface. You've got javelina and deer and rabbits. They don't. They seem to leave the evergreens alone. 